is Microphone Check, Hip Hop from NPR Music. I'm Franny Kelly. I'm Ali Shaheed Muhammad. I'm Malcolm Spellman. Thank you for coming. I'm glad to be here. Uh-huh. <laughs> We're glad to talk to you after the season finale of Empire, for which, what is your official title? Um, it was co-producer season one, now I'll be producer. Okay. Um, for the, we're about to go back into the room in like two weeks and get started. Oh man, you left a lot of people hanging. It, it, it's been really interesting to see the conversation of, so for screenwriting, everything is about intent, right? Okay. What are you, what feeling are you trying to evoke? Right, and then yeah. you wonder if it's going to be pulled off. So for this mm-hmm. finale, it's like you want people to feel like this, and to be in a bar or whatever and seeing it, you're like, oh shit, you know, it, it worked. How responsible? I'm sorry, I cuss a lot. It's no. totally fine. We right. on the show. Yeah. <laughs> I can't stop so. myself, so all right, good. No, everybody's allowed. Um, what was your involvement in the line? Game on, bitches. That that wasn't me. So at at all. Okay. No, no involvement. So there is the top-down dynamic is you have the creators, Lee and Danny Strong. Mm-hmm. I mean, Lee Daniels and Danny Strong, right, who created the, the, the world. Yeah. And then they brought on, they brought on a showrunner, Eileen Chaikin, who runs all of There's, like, I think seven or eight writers in the room, mm-hmm. and Eileen governs all of us and leads us or whatever, right? So it, it matriculates upward. Mm-hmm. Or downward, depending on what the the big dogs are doing. Okay. So I, I it's and you get lost. There's so much stuff being fired from all these people. I don't know. That for sure wasn't mine, but it, it's hard to tell anyway. Okay. Um, and it'd probably be inappropriate. I got some good shit in there, but it, it'd be inappropriate for me to start claiming because it's a, such a collaborative thing. Right. You know what I'm saying? I can't start. All right, fine. But I got some winners. <laughs> So we wanted to talk to you about how hip hop relates to it and how, I guess, true to life, the music industry as it operates now is to the show. It seems to me like what is happening on the show is more like what the industry was a few years ago. Um, I mean, how much how much do you care about how realistic what's happening? So the 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 first thing you always have to look for is narrative drama. Uh-huh. That trumps everything. That's like anytime you see a true story based on whatever, a lot of it's going to be a lie. A lot of it's going to be stuff that was fabricated to feel like what the true story would be, right? Because okay. you got to honor, the, you know what I'm saying, drama and conflict first. Mm-hmm. Um, so that supersedes everything. You are right that this label does exist a lot like a label in the glory days of hip hop. And it's a bigger thing than that, right? Yeah. But that said, we bring in like we, the consultants and stuff who come in really super high power people who are like the most relevant in the business today, they feed us uh, uh, what the current state of music is and that finds its way in also. So if we're talking about Empire Records, on its face, it kind of looks like a, a, what a record label used to be before the kingdom collapse, right. but you'll see the stories within that a lot, like you'll see younger characters like gotta hit up a blogger or whatever to get this shit out there, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And also the way that celebrity culture is like has changed a little bit now. You yeah, know, the, the gotcha, the gotcha culture. Yeah, and the idea that, like, you look at the perception. There's a scene where uh, uh, where Hakeem disses Obama, and mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying. And yeah. by the way, everyone's a fan of Obama in that room. But uh, <laughs> Hakeem disses Obama and pees on the floor, or whatever, right? And you can see the the age gap in the characters, right? Like you can see Lucius is, you know, furious about why the fuck would you act like that or whatever, right? And the younger characters understand, Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Whether it's stated explicitly, they understand, you know, this, you do what you do, you get it out there and it could take off, it could go viral, which is what happened that thing. So again, that's that's relevant, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it's also kind of a way to, I mean, there's a lot of, among my friends at least, trying to be like, oh, who's the Tommy Mottola character? Who's the Rihanna character or whatever? So in some ways, it seems to me there's like a retelling of some of the legends of the hip hop industry or these like characters. Absolutely. Okay, that's intentional. I yeah, thought we absolutely. were making it all up. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. It's, it's literally like, again, it's probably not appropriate to yeah. say names, but like, did you, the, 
the, the, the it's, it's every, any time, yeah, all that shit is based on a real story. Someone who comes okay. in and gives us, like, real, you can see that sometimes when the details come out, you should know yeah. that didn't come from nowhere. And literally, the superstructure also is based on something real that occurred. Yeah, you guys, you guys aren't making that up. It's, there's a lot of mirroring, okay. um, you know, and then a lot, then you have to add the flavor, you know, you got to warp it or change it or shift it to make it the most dramatic and compelling you can be. Mm, but right. like Elle Dallas, for it, there was a great, the stories that came right. in to create her mm-hmm. were, is some, some, love, yeah, character, yeah, some real, some very real, very big, tragic stuff. People really responded to that storyline. That mm-hmm. like, and also her performance. Yeah, she crushed it. She brings her whole backstory to the table. And I could be mistaken here. I'm almost sure that was lead casting. Like, mm-hmm. that dude definitely has a gift for making everybody involved say, what the fuck? You know what I'm saying? And then you're, once it goes down, you cannot imagine how anyone else would have been cast there or, or if it's a scene, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And for the, so for that one, maybe not everyone said that, but I, was, I would have never expected Courtney Love to be on our show. Yeah, it was a good... I was wondering, just for, from her experience, was that even more of a challenge? to play that character because it seemed like it could be so close to her, her life in certain aspects. It, 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 so that, whatever's happening behind the scenes in that particular storyline is above my pay grade, yeah. but I felt that too. Like that, like once I started seeing dailies come in of what was being shot, you, that's what I'm saying. It's like her whole backstory is right there on the table, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And she's, she, she, she's very vocal about her stuff. So. It definitely added a weight and a pathos, you know what I'm saying, that was deeper than just some lines written and acted. But that's also another way the show plays into the social media age that we live in. Because a lot of the press I read about it is like, it's so dramatic, it's the new dynasty or whatever. But it has these extra layers of ways that we can dissect it and relate and relate to it or like feel like we know more of the story than we normally do. So it sounds like that was all on purpose and it, a winning formula. It, you know, it's hard. Like, I don't want to pretend that everyone connected every single dot on what the, how successful and how much this would resonate with people, but I don't want to downplay that these writers are in this room and they're talking about how people, when you're talking about the social media aspect, like, they're not trying to say, oh, we're trying to gain the system, gain the system and get people to do this. But because a lot of them are very active in social media or whatever, they're aware that, like, well, man, when we do this, people are going to feel, you know, they, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Well, they're like, if it, if it were me and I saw that. Yeah, that exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, question about the music and as it being a script in and of itself. Is the music, in certain aspects, the music created to cr- before the, the, the story is written to help? push the story along, along or is it the story dictates what the music is supposed to be in terms of it being a script? A lot of times it is the story and uh, Tim Timberland and his team are great about this. Like Tim will send, he's got his, 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 his right hand man, Jim Beans, will come into the writer's room, right? And he'll get, we map out the global of the thing, right? So the process before it gets to the, to the music level is, the room has a general idea on where it's gonna go, right? The big dogs will go, they'll set the, the big bull's eyes before we even come in. And then it starts to get broken down in a more and more refined way, right? So that, like, to the point that we may not know exactly what happens in an episode, but you have an idea that Jamal's gonna need a song like this. And Jim will come in and talk with us and, you know, challenge us, like, well, okay, how does he feel? You know what I'm saying? Like, he'll get very, he knows dramatically what's going to happen before he goes back and starts working with Tim on creating it. So, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, pre, it's pretty dope, like, to see that happen. It's such a, I mean, the, the, the lyrics and the music tell a story in of itself. It's so, like, deep in, I think, a strong script line in of itself. And it's, I'm just was fascinated by that. Yeah, it, it's an it's a amazing resource, too, because there is a net, we have so much confidence in them, and they'll, they'll deepen it, too. Like, Tim will be like, man, this shit is for my life. So, like, as the story, we know what the song needs to be, right. Yeah. right? He's delivering it, and the texture from his stuff might add details to the scenes that will eventually be written, 
but there's also now a confidence in the uh, uh, in the writers room. We might not even have to say this. You know what I'm saying? Like this song is going to do so much. You know what I'm saying? When it comes in, that that's going to be more potent than anything. You know what I'm saying? That, that we could say or write or you know what I'm saying? You know what I, I most love about it is the fact that this company empire that Lucius is trying to take public is so ambitious and daring that um, I'm not sure of any of the hip hop moguls who have had, um, you know, like Russell, who probably with Def Jam is probably like the most successful um, rap label um, that has gotten close enough. Maybe, I don't know what Master P did with No Limit or what, what ha- has happened with Cash Money, but in, in the sense of going public, that's ambitious as hell. It, it's so you know it was helpful for that is we you know Brian Grazier is one of the producers right yeah. and he took his company public and so again that's the great thing about these these people they bring into the room the you have an idea of what you want to happen dramatically and narratively and then the real life shit is so much better and more it, you know what I'm saying like so he can talk us through that and what the pressure is like you know what I'm saying like you you, you because you go when you go in public. You know this is one of the things we learned. You know in talking to to, to Grazier, is the stakes become all or nothing. You were fine before you ever tried to go public, right. but if you fuck that up, you know what I'm saying you've destroyed what you had that you was going to carry into the you know bigger level, or whatever. Um, so yeah, that it, it's just interesting how like. Um, um, that might not be directly hip hop, but you yeah. you have trust us. The Russell Russell's book is in there, is in the room. Everyone's read it, and then you bring in a dude who's took you know a company public to add the flavor. You know what I'm saying? Um, question: This may be so like um, trivial, but the golden emblem that hangs over Lucius' uh, chair is that a deliberate, or is that just like one of those props that just look cool? Because it's it's. Uh, it looks like what are those psychological? What is that that block called? Rorschach. Rorschach. It's you know what, I, I don't know because there's a second there's a creative conversation yeah. with the higher level folks. You know what I'm saying? Where you I mean you're talking to department heads like you got all these people like when you're putting together a TV show. I don't know that the general public really understands the motherfucker that's doing props and sets and building this room right mm-hmm. is also a creative genius yeah. and has wants to add texture to the scene. Yeah. So they're going to talk about everything that's happening in that room and what it's going to do and they're going to challenge you. And then so like Eileen or Lee and Danny have to be like, well, we didn't mean it like that. We don't want that vibe. And they want to know and then they're going to dress it up. So there's a chance, you know what I'm saying, like that level of stuff, if if not specifically that, that is occurring all the time on these sets. And in, in any good TV or movie, that's, that's you know what I'm saying, that's, that's part of what's, that's a layer. So not to kill, you know, you, you said earlier about, you know, creating drama or this, that's precedent over maybe what may be factual, but is being uh, contentious the enemy of what's happening on Empire? Because it seems like these people have everything. Mm-hmm. They have the world. Mm-hmm. Like each one of them have the world, and it's not enough. Man, you know how real that is, though. You, like, when... When they say more money, more problems, you know what I'm saying? That shit is, I'm all in, in my uh, outside ventures in this music thing, I'm already seeing just on a microscopic level mm. that shit, you know what I'm saying? And so that is definitely something I think, you know, you grow up a certain way and you have an idea if you're going to be an athlete or rapper or whatever, right? How it's gonna, money is going to solve everything. And then here you have this family that has it and all this shit is on display for you. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And you're like, no, it magnifies everything. You know what I'm saying? It intensifies it. And it's and I believe that that's 100 percent honest. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I think, you know, what I'm saying like that's real. That's crazy. Um, how if you're going to build an empire and. You worry about. In building an empire, your family, how, how does one not protect their family? To, like, I'm, I'm speaking of the episode where, where Lucius is just telling uh, um, Jamal, like, he left them open to the wolves, basically. 
you know, and in that one at one scene where he's in the studio and, you know, some people come up in the studio on a stick-up mission, I'm like, if you're going to secure your empire, you got to worry about even, like, the smallest of... You can't leave any aspect open like that because then it shows your vulnerability. It, but remember what you're dealing with, like, with these super egos. Yeah the same thing that makes them propels them to the top like how many people do we know where you're wondering why they even in it anymore you know what i'm saying and why they're getting involved with heavyweight shit drama or whatever right so the ego and the things that drive lucius aren't completely rational all the time you know what i'm saying there's a lot of id in that character we talked about that like a discussion will be is it mostly id or mostly intellectual, you know what I'm saying? And so his decision-making process will at times seem like the most calculating motherfucker. Like he's damn near like Walter, but even Walter White's that character. Right. Like in the end, his ego undoes him and makes him do completely irrational stuff. And so I'm trying to remember the exact scene you're talking about. I mean, I remember when the, when the stick-up dudes come, yeah. but if he's doing something that violates what would be the obviously smart way to go, it's just coming from that from that facet of that character. Well, there's also all this, like he's motivated, but he doesn't understand why he's so upset about Jamal being gay, right? Well, I he acts he, irrationally in that regard all the time. Yeah, all the time. I get it. I just, I mean, like if you, you're building an empire, like you want to make sure, like side. even like the, the, it's your son, you know. So you, you're vulnerable if he's kidnapped. Oh shoot. You know, right. does your empire crumble? I'm probably being a little bit too specific about that little thing, but it just it it reminds me of um, just human nature, and again, not being satisfied and in, uh, in pursuing whatever it is that you want from life. And I think that the story it has such a draw because of the backdrop of hip hop, and I think it's showing hip hop in a way that hasn't been seen before. Yeah, you can't beat, I mean, that's the thing, the real, you just can't beat it. So we have all those stories coming into this room, and exactly, it's just, you, you again, experience so much of the stuff firsthand, it's got to be like, even if it's overblown and dressed up and glitzy or whatever, it feels like you, you're like, ah, oh, man, I know, <laughs> I know that dude or that woman, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, it's all, you should, uh, we got all the books there. You know, all of us have some kind of experience. There's even more people coming in now who, like, with deep, deep, deep history of hip-hop, and, and and we bring in these consultants who tell these stories, and they come in and they spend days with us sometimes, you know what I'm saying? And, yeah, that shit, they, it, it laces it and, and, and gives it that truth, even when it's going, even if it's going to a spectacular place like Dallas or Dynasty does. What I think is propelling this shit to the degree that, it keeps going up and keeps sticking with people is there's this, I don't know that on Dallas or dynasty common folks felt a truth to the level that they do on empire. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you say? I hate it. Sorry. I hate it when people ask that question that way. Dude, that's the best question to ask. What is it? No. Well, people criticize empire for being exploitative or um, that it's cartoonish and it's putting, it's like making black people look bad. It's so, in the end, first off, you can't avoid that, particularly with black folk. Like we get, we've dealt with so much shit getting here. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's hard, like we're nervous, you know what I'm saying? Like I remember when Blackish came out, yeah. so many people were terrified of what it might be simply because the title was Blackish. And it turned out to be brilliant and part of this movement. Like, there's a big change happening in Hollywood right now because of started by Shonda, you know what I'm saying? Then Kenya, Kenya came in with Blackish. And I, we should, if you guys had time, whatever, like, we'll, we'll talk about that. And this is a, a passionate thing for me, but not, not to get to your question, whatever, right? So, but look what it took coming to there, you know what I'm saying? Like, look at, and so we do the, the, everyone, Black, white, and America is the fucking thing, no matter, you know what I'm saying? It just is the thing. And black folks and white folks who are, they, we just get uncomfortable, you know what I'm saying? Here's a show that is black from creators 
to the writer's room, to the cast. You know what I'm saying? Like this, there, this is a very, very, very black show. And there's going to just be an unease there, number one. Um, overall, the support for this show, which is boring to talk about, is so much bigger and drowns out. Like if you go, if you go to Twitter and look at Boycott Empire, look what happens. You know what I'm saying? Like, so the person who wants to boy, boycott Empire, that's more interesting to talk about. But look at their Twitter feed. You know what I'm saying? It's all folks like, you know, fuck. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This shit is awesome. Why would you, you know? Yeah, we spoke to, I didn't speak to, you didn't speak to Cedric. Um, we did an event. It was a screening of the film, The Spook Who Sat by the Door. Mm -hmm. And people on the panel, one of the persons on the panel was Greg Carr, who's the head of the African American History Department at Howard. And he was like, dog in it. He was like, it's not, it's not good for us. But I still watch it. <laughs> and also partly because I want to know what's going on, but I still watch it. And so I think that it's the, it's the intellectual, the not uh, academic community it, it, that it feels it, the need to respond. It's funny, like, I, I, I move in a way, I'm very, very confident about my moral compass mm -hmm. and my obligation. To, I'm extremely confident about it. Like, when I didn't have no money as a screenwriter or whatever, there were projects that came my way and I was like, no, fuck no, I'm not doing that, you know what I'm saying? So I feel very, very sure about what we're putting out, um, um, like bra to, the, to the point of being brazen. And I think that most of, the, most of the stuff that's, most of the people who are uptight about it kind of have an obligation. Their career is based on finding, like you, you have to, you, you're not gonna have nothing to say. If you don't have a problem with Empire, what are you going to write about, right? Mm -hmm. On another level, what these people really don't understand, because Hollywood is such a closed thing, <clears throat> is the sea change that has happened. And it's permanent, I think, this time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because the movie business and TV business are in a desperate state or whatever. Here comes this, again, it's really important for me to acknowledge, like, you have Shonda, who very quietly was like, you look back at what she's done and you hear her talk. That shit ain't by accident that she's changing the palette of television. Mm -hmm. And these are billion dollar moves she's making, multiple, and not just bi a billion dollars now, ongoing for decades, yeah. right? And then you have Kenya coming through with some cutting edge shit, and then you have Empire, and the people who are uptight about it don't understand whatever it is you do want to see is now viable. Right. Because, because the final thing, we, you know what I'm saying? And f Lee, Danny, Eileen, all of us in the room. I don't know if Fox is aware, but motherfuckers are aware of that. Like yeah. people, like so, the there is a sense of duty going on here also, and it's huge what has happened. I'm telling you, I'm a screenwriter. This, year. go ahead. No, I, I didn't want you to finish your statement. I'm just thinking that you know I, I haven't seen a lot of criticism, but I just think well, if that is really you know people cry about empire I'm like then what happens on the Maury Povich show in terms of the way that black, <laughs> yeah. that, that black well, people I mean if yeah. there's this I mean like there's things that you could really really be upset about but I I see past that and I just see the story of which is historic and it has it doesn't have a color on on it for me it's a historic um story of having a family and and you having nothing and you grow into having everything and you wanting to protect that and you wanting to make sure that the, through the generations, it, it, whatever it is that you've built will continue to, to build. And in, the, in that infrastructure, you're going to have natural sort of dynamic between family where there's people who ride with you and there's people who are jealous of your situation mm -hmm. and people who um, see it as a means, see the, the wealth as a means for them to... Uh, get a piece of it in any way that they can, be it, you know, a relative, an assistant, or whatever, and the things that people will do to attach themselves to that. I mean, it's just like a regular basic human story to me, and you're going to have people siding and, and family where there's, you know, siblings. There's some siblings that get along with the others and there's some siblings that don't. Or um, in, in this particular case, there's, again, a great deal of wealth that's at stake, and I don't think that has color it's not a racial thing to me. It's just a human 
I, I agree. It's also particularly American, right? Yeah. Meaning at the core of this country, this story is appealing, including the criminality yeah. at the base of it, because on a macro level, right, some rough ass people came here, served the natives, you know what I'm saying? Yeah and built up their shit yeah. and they felt righteous in doing it because they had to do what they had to do. It was problems back home, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I think that definitely, like you're saying, that's, that's just human and specifically American. Like we forget those stories don't exist in, you know, my mom's French, right? And she's like, you ain't making your name. It just maybe changed now, but it's like that shit, their culture is you were born to a certain station in life, and that's pretty much what it's going to be. Right. But that sense of going hard to build something for you and your family and prospering or whatever is distinctly American and definitely it transcends race. You know what I'm saying? And it, it, it shows. It, it is it, everybody, whether most 90 percent of the population is never going to make moves to really move their station in life, but they all feel like they could. And when they see, and I, I think, yeah, I think that's in the numbers, and I agree. It, it's uh, yeah, it's about the structure of wealth. I'm reading that Thomas Piketty book about in inequity and and how it all works on an economic level, and it's like when there when inherited wealth is really important, then and growth is not really happening, then we all just sort of stay. There isn't much we can do about it. But here, over the year, there were times when things were, were really unstable and you couldn't count on inherited wealth. And so that's when things really do grow and you invent things and you change whole industries and then that changes growth down the road. So yeah, but yeah, rough people come here. You know, my people came here from nothing and like, <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, you wanted to talk, well, when we talk about the show, um, we were talking about the songs and I was wondering, I asked him how closely they relate like, if that's real, that something happens in your life and then you go in a studio and you make a song about it. It seems convenient for your process, but you said that's really how it works. Well, yeah, well, because you draw on life, you know, and you go into the studio with it, and I think maybe that's what's happening in this, the storyline where there's things that's happening in the life and they seemingly go into the studio and record about these things, but it just, it's, it's done so well. Mm -hmm. it made me wonder um, if the music was dictating some of what was happening. It, it, it's you, you know, I can't tell the percentage on when it happens that way. I know because I'm most focused on when we know we're going to need a song that relates to that, but it's still going to, it's still the process to capture that is, you know, that's very, very deliberate. Like, like what's talked about before that scene is ever written in two or three months there's a discussion of we're trying to push Jamal to a place where he feels like this and because of who he is and because he's an artist and because we're talking to people like Jamal who are coming in the room, there is a sense that, yeah, we, uh, cer certain events got to happen to push him to the point where he's going to get in that studio and, you know what I'm saying, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be some scene that feels like this. Is, is it deliberate to talk about or when... You guys, uh, when the show is created, maybe you have some insight on this and to tackle certain ish, uh, certain things like the bipolar aspect of what's happening or the homosexual aspect of what's happening in a hip hop community setting. Like you guys are really pushing issues that I don't think have ever been seen maybe in a black story. Is that was that intentional or is it just these things that were discovered that as you know, talking to other people um, who are giving you information about the music industry, you know, some of your, your consultants, or these, these conversations that came up that they felt things needed to be it, important? It's very intentional. Okay. And here's what makes Empire unique. That writer's room has gay people, a lot of black people, Latinos, people from disparate backgrounds. That the... That seems like duh to you guys, but that shit's not happening in other writers' rooms, right? So the opinions like, I don't want to air myself out, but I've been ignorant about certain things. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And because it's such a warm environment in there, I'll say some shit, and one of the gay writers will be like, dude, you know what I'm saying? And that discussion's coming out. But let me just say, even from the beginning, um, Lee and Danny were very, like, for the 
the pushing the thing with with a gay storyline and the conflicts about that in the hip hop community that was understood that we were going to be exploring that from season one before any of us even came on to the show. And some of the most powerful scenes are real, real stories from Lee. You know what I'm saying? And I think people can tell when they're... You can fucking tell. You know what I'm saying? Like, you feel it. You know what I'm saying? And so that thread was before we even came onto it, they knew they wanted to explore that. The very quickly, the, uh, uh, the bipolar thing, again... You know, we all, like, so in our room, the discussion is, if you don't have no black people in the room, you don't know that you will be told crazy, unless you are literally schizophrenic, you know, for a lot of us, you ain't crazy, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, like, da, 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 right? But because that's in our room, yeah. the conflict for the bipolar thing can really, really be explored in a compelling way that's feeling like a fucking release. So many people are like, dude, finally. And the reason it hasn't been happening before is because they don't put no, they don't put us in the room. You know what I'm saying? They don't, they don't yeah. have these other voices. And I, I, if I'm sounding like it's specifically black, it's not. It's just our, our shit be so hyper concentrated of what American stuff is that if we do the black version of it, Everybody feels like their bipolar story is being told. You know, what I'm saying? being told. Yeah. But that's also we've been talking about this recently in interviews. I don't really know why, but but like that's also an immigrant way of experiencing yes. mental yes. illness. Yes. And so that's how like my family relates to it. That that's what I'm saying. Is like if you do the black version, yeah. you're really doing. You're making sure you get everyone because it's to concentrate. Yeah, it's too. gonna be the yeah. immigrant. You know, what I'm saying. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I totally agree. I like Andre. He's like mad at me because I like Andre. I'm not mad. I just noticed you really like him. <laughs> <laughs> off. I'm gonna leave that alone. <laughs> anyway, um, what do you? I mean, we all want to know what. Do, what do you most want to get in next season? Um, I probably am. First of all. It'll be again the, the the first thing that'll happen is the 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 various EPs like you have Lee, Danny, Eileen, Wendy is is another one of the EPs. I don't know like that discussion. Some of that will be discussed before I come in yeah. into the into the room, and then there's definitely some stuff I want to get into, but I got to see what the big dogs are saying first. And I don't know if it's appropriate for me to to, to on, I don't I don't know I don't like want to get in trouble. Okay. This shit, well, this shit is so big it's dangerous now. Like this is <laughs> it is I'd be nervous now talking to people. You know what I'm saying? Because okay. it's these it's you're dealing with a terrified community mm. that thought for sure what's happening now was done. So much so, they're even now still, some people try and dismiss it. Like, well, that's only because, you know what I'm saying? No one can accept that maybe the audience hasn't been getting served in a way they wanted to. But the outside of that is, it's such a treasure to people who are going to make billions of dollars off of it. I don't want to fuck around and get my head chopped off. Yeah, that's <laughs> a rock and a hard place. <laughs> um, but um, how much do you care if the songs from the show become like like enter the world as songs all by themselves or hit the charts or whatever. It seems to me like that's not even a part of the planning. Like nope, they, it, yeah. it wasn't, which is good. It, that's where a lot of shit needs to be at now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? A lot of stuff needs to happen organically. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they, I, they, I, I, we're, no one's thinking like that. Right. You know, Tim is just doing the dopest, Tim and Jim Beans are doing the dopest mm -hmm. stuff they can do. We're pushing, you know what I'm saying? And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, there's a number one record here. Yeah. And hopefully that'll still be the imperative for season two. Right, right. How much did the success of Nashville help get Empire off the ground? Do you know? I, I would guess not much. I think, again, the process is a brutally inadvertently racist system based on myths like it's first of all everyone who is barring the reason there hasn't been black folks on tv is not because anyone is saying they don't like black folks in fact in hollywood 
everyone wants that. They want diversity or whatever, but they don't know how to do it. So when I'm saying racist, it's not, I don't know if it's racist people. It's just a system that tells you if we put black people on screen, it's going to have less value overseas and domestic, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So again, really important for people to understand, Shonda started chipping away at that shit yeah. and got to become such a boss, she could just start telling people, I'm fucking chipping away at this shit, you know what I'm saying? And then a few more things came in place. And if you meet Lee, have you guys ever sat down with Lee? No. He's a force, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like that. So it wasn't Nashville, it's that process and then comes this dude, and I don't want to, and Danny too, you know what I mean, Danny's a writer though, you know what I'm saying? Um, um, Lee is a dude who will be in the room, you're gonna have to deal with him, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you, you're not gonna just tell him it's too black, mm. you know what I'm saying? So, I, I wouldn't say Nashville, I, I believe the story is public, so I'm not being inappropriate. I believe the story was Fox expected the show to debut at a 1-8, you know what I'm saying? Right, yeah. In the demo, which is, that's the important number, and it debuted at a 3.8. Mm -hmm. So the ex I don't think there was an expectation. Like, I don't think, I think he was, a, they figured, fuck it, we'll let this these guys, this combustible dude have what he wants, you know what I'm saying? And we'll do, we'll have a moderate success. Right. But I don't think Nashville ever came into the conversation. Like, I don't think they knew they was going to be having number one records, you know what I'm saying, coming off this show. Right. And right. maybe a clothing line now and huge tennis shoes. and Who? Cookie? Who? I don't care about anybody else's clothes. I feel like Cookie got to have a clothing line, right? Yeah. And, I, and I don't know. If I get fired because of this, I swear to God, I have no idea if that's the plan. But I feel like that's got to happen. You know what I'm saying? Like, that would be, why wouldn't you? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Women love her, you know? Yes. Um, also hair. Hmm? Also hair. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. We will help you with this business plan if you want. If you talk to Rupert <laughs> and Lee <laughs> <laughs> and Eileen. I, I, I don't feel like I'm saying her name enough. Like that's who's in the room with us, guiding us and, you know what I'm saying? Um, so. Yeah, I mean, people don't always. I think people understand more nowadays what the showrunner job is and and how responsible they are for like the whole thing. It's insane. Yeah, it, it is. It is again. Like, I did the showrunners training program where they bring in all the biggest showrunners who are active in the game, and man, one of them does this description of like what your day is. So, as you, the the way the season begins is. You start mapping out the season, and then you start mapping out episodes, and, you know, it starts to become that. And at some point, production begins. So you're trying to do as much of that narrative, because right. without scripts, nothing's happening, right? Mm -hmm. And at some point, once you're, like, midway through the season, production starts to catch up on the screenplays that are coming in. And so you'll have a, a showrunner will have in a day to break an outline that will become a script, give notes, or do a rewrite on a script. You have an episode that's in edit. These are all different episodes. Mm -hmm. An episode that is in edit, that's a shot episode that's got to that's be put together. An episode that's being spotted for sound. These are all, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. All this stuff was going on. And then you might find out there was a snowstorm in Chicago and production has been shut down. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's running, mm -hmm. while all this other shit is going on. Um, nah, it's... <laughs> you got to be a formidable person to do it. And you're writing. You're rewriting. You're writing. And because you're, you, you're honoring the network has, you know, they, they, they need the show to be what it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're dealing with that stuff. You know what I'm saying? It, it's, it's an intense job. Mm -hmm. What do you think that Empire is doing, like positive or negative for hip hop culture? Well, really, is, I, I'm asking about the business like, do you think that Empire is getting more people interested in spending money on anything that might come out of hip hop culture? It, it's got to be intriguing people, I think, because just on its face as a venture, forget hip hop, on its face as a venture, this was something that they th thought was done. A mm -hmm. TV show that stood in and growing like they didn't, they yeah. thought that's done, which means if you're a business person, well, fuck, maybe, maybe this model that we thought was broken or dead might have some, some life back into it. So there's that aspect. Maybe we'll get bigger music video budgets. That's what I was thinking. Well, that's very specific. But I'm saying also I think anyone, I think 
you got to reopen the books now yeah. about, man, maybe we can do some shit just as maybe stuff is viable that we thought wasn't viable. And then as far as like kids, we get the feedback from like, it's definitely inspiring, you know what I'm saying, particularly Jamal. But, you know, Yaz, all them, like all these, all these, these characters are definitely inspiring kids. And hopefully because there's a premium on honesty, like if you see, uh, uh, yeah, Hakeem, the Hakeem character lashing out his mom on a song or whatever, there will be, since hip hop's going in that way anyway, mm -hmm. this will help accelerate just the culture of content, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. being honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Is there anything else you want to make sure that we talked about? Um, I'm curious as to why, if, uh, why the relationship between Cookie and the oldest son Dre, why is it so strange? Usually in situations where if there's, you know, three kids and the mom is sent away to prison, at least the oldest kid who's had the most time to spend with the mother, their bonds should be a lot tighter and it's so far apart. So you, the dynamics going on here are, number one, Dre is the one who was oldest and most aware of how fucked up life was in Philly, right? And had desperately wanted to change that and not be associated with it. Right. You know what I'm saying? So you have that element. Your mother going to prison, look at where he was going, to Wharton. You know what I'm saying? So you had that dynamic there. On top of that, there was, and I swear these are real discussions that we're having before, like this is the subtext that people are feeling, whether it's, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. whether it's stated or overt. There was the sense that from Cookie, bipolar doesn't show up yet, right? But your kid's a little bit odd, you know what I'm saying? So that's going to create a fracture. And most importantly, Cookie had to save Jamal's life. And so you have to invest in, in all that. And, you know, that, that's going to create a dynamic within the family, you know what I'm saying? I get it. Yeah. It's, it's such a fascinating job that you have to, to think about people's motivations and backgrounds and, like, that's the best part. observe that and figure out a way to play it out that's also entertaining. And you don't, you, it's unbelievable how these actors, you think it's not possible, like you had these sophisticated conversations and you think it's not possible to, for it to be conveyed. Mm -hmm. And you see these actors take that shit, make that real and add four or five different layers. It's crazy to see what they're doing with it. It's great. Cause those are high level, that's another thing, you know what I'm saying? Like, yes. you got movie stars yeah. who are used to punching it out on screen with giants, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. the, the, man, they add dimensions that literally nobody in the world would have ever thought about. And they're ad-libbing. Like they're, they're, oh, they're, yeah? Yeah, no, nah, it's, uh, it's, there's some of the most iconic lines, I, I don't know what percentage of them are, 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 are ad-libs from them. But that's the flash. That's Duncan from the free throw line, the real shit that to me is crazy is seeing the layers and dimensions and like just how the tone of a scene can shift because in these these amazing actors yeah. are interpreting it and adding all these details to it beneath, mm -hmm. beneath the surface. I cut you off, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. No. Well, unless you had anything else, I like um, just wanna go watch the show now. So. Yeah, well last thing, just what would you tell an upcoming screenwriter? You know, what are maybe two key things that they should uh, focus on? Um, I just talked about this on, a, on a, a thing that will become a podcast soon. It is, I feel like what's happening in this age of information, right, is that everybody is a little bit too savvy. Um, whether you're being a screenwriter or an artist or whatever, right? Like if you guys watch American Idol, you can see these kids come in off the street and their hand gestures and just the way and their vocal choices are all the shit that a polished you know what I'm saying? I'm sure it's not quite, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, what happens is you start to exclude the weird shit that you might have done as a singer or this relates mm -hmm. exactly as a writer, right? There, yeah. there, these writers are coming in very, very conscious of genre, very, very conscious of moving a reader through a page, you know what I'm saying? And more... What used to be the problem in screenwriting is people wrote shit that's too personal. It's like, dude, no one cares about you and your fucking friends and how... Now it's gone the opposite way. Now everyone's super, super slick and super, super aware of content or whatever. So I think the first thing to do is ask yourself a question. Why does this story ex deserve to exist in the marketplace? What is it that I'm saying and what is it specific about me 
that no one else could fucking do mm. or say and get out there. That'd be the number one thing. Same thing a musician should figure out. Huh? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And maybe that's going to come back with music. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you guys will push the bar and get people to think before they go into the studio. <laughs> I know it kills you. Yeah. <laughs> I know you'd be like, I'm coming out and sit out. <laughs> I mean, you know, we all, freedom of whatever, life, expression, go with it. But I mean, just be, have a purpose is my thing. I, I agree. It's a purpose. purpose of point of view is, it's weird that like you can look at hip hop and see the biggest, like if you look at Kanye, M, and Kendrick, these motherfuckers have the most specific point of view, whether you like them or not. But everyone's imitating the punchline. You know what I'm saying? It's like, dude, don't you see who's winning? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and find your voice. Yep. Yeah. Great. Thank you for spending this time with us. Yes. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Um, I was excited to come in, so um, really appreciate it. Um, and hopefully I didn't say nothing that's going to get me in trouble. I'm just paranoid. Nah, you cool. We'll turn the mics off and you can give us some more. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think they need to look at you and say, well, if if uh, Terrence is, he gets a, if he's too sick, you could fill in as a double. Like, <laughs> become Lucius, the, 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 like, you know, Lucius, the twin brother who comes out of nowhere and you don't know what he happens. thought he killed him he but he, he didn't kill him, him but he didn't yeah. kill him yeah, yeah I, like I, 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 I happily play Lucy's shady <laughs> twin brother like the, the less intelligent lion like <laughs> this motherfucking the Homer Simpson had a brother who uh oh yeah yeah remember that yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember that I do <laughs> you gotta watch all 400 episodes of The Simpsons to catch that one I can't I have too many mixtapes to listen to alright thank you again um thank you guys for having me yeah. really appreciate it seriously alright yeah Ha, <laughs>